Hearing come to order. The uh, subcommittee chairman will be here in a moment, but one of the few great prerogatives of the chair is I also have the ability to bring it back to order. Thank you for uh, staying over the break, and we will break the voting break, and uh, you will see members straggling back in shortly. I have a short series of questions for you, and they really have to do with the work that the RAT Board has been doing. As far as we can tell, uh, and both the, myself, the former chairman and the current ranking member have all gone over, reviewed it, seen some of the discoveries, but particularly seen what we see is the first time in which there has been a direct outreach uh, to, rep to get reporting, to get it in a, in, a, in a format that is consistent and usable, and then use it against, uh, against other databases to det detect fraud. At the current time, OMB, from what we can tell, has no comprehensive plan to bring a similar recipient reporting system across the government. Can you comment on that? Yes. Um, first of all, I would say that we are completely committed to uh, carrying forward some of the important accomplishments that the Recovery Board has, has had. Uh, one of the major areas where they have been successful, as you have noted, is the deployment of a forensic data tool and a fraud detection tool. It is for that reason that the President's budget includes a proposal to move into the Department of Treasury. You are talking about the $10 million? The $10 million for the Do Not Pay solution, which would adopt very similar approaches that the Recovery Board has adopted in terms of uh, having uh, a central place where uh, the Treasury Department in this, in this case would be assisting agencies in looking across all data sources where we can get access to both well, the public and, and that is where I want to stop yeah, you. Please. The President, by executive order, could require all the agencies, I have been told at least, to cooperate in a way in which the reporting would be assumed and thus that $10 million investment would be able to guarantee that it would have access subject to data integrity and, and ability to transmit it uh, to do the kind of work the RAT Board has done. As you know, the RAT Board leveraged basically Katrina Rita uh, data. They, they leveraged existing uh, one-time events in order to get more access. They have been unable, except anecdotally by transfers that they have been able to get, they have been unable to get the real tr access that would allow cross-platform, and Treasury certainly would have the authority and the confidence. Are you prepared to, either legislatively or through executive action, get that kind of buy-in, or will it be, with all due respect, the old mealy mouth, we are OMB, we do things collegially, we get buy-in, which is crap, it never works. And if you say it does, I will have Mitch Daniels sitting in your seat explaining that it doesn't work before you, you know, by Sunday morning. That is my question to you, because your teeth are not sharp enough to cut through bureaucracy. Are you asking for something that would give either you and or, in this case, Treasury the teeth to make this a reality? I think the answer to that is yes. I mean, we have to balance the, uh, as we break down data silos that exist in government today and create the, enable us to do the type of analytics that are going to drive more powerful assessments around finding anomalies, fraud and error. There will be other public policy balances that need to come into place, including, for example, privacy and other implications and data security. It is my position that we can achieve a far greater efficiency and streamlining of data share and data interoperability across Federal agencies while still meeting uh, important privacy and security objectives. So it can be what, done. What data, has, what data does the Federal Government have which you are prohibited from accessing for purposes of analysis? Uh, for purposes of it, well, there are, the, 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 for example, one of the more protected databases, the IRS database, is an example. And to the extent there is personally identifiable information or tax information, Section 6103 of the Code would prevent that type of movement of data. Another great example is the National Directory of New Hires. Right. But let us yeah. go through the, uh, because the IRS is the best known by the, the American people. The, the IRS routinely takes information in, digests it, and responds to State laws federal and state laws. If you have a deadbeat dad in Minnesota who leaves and goes to Florida or any other state, 
the, the, uh, the Minnesota input data leads to an output data that confirms the availability of the dollars, allows for the grabbing of the tax return, and thus the movement of it either to public entities that have taken care of the mother and child or to uh, uh, directly to the individual or, for that matter, even to a State coffer uh, on a State tax. So if you have that authority within the Code, can't you, without looking at it, create a leverage where you send the data in a format the IRS can absorb with your request and you get back only the limited response? Isn't it true that you can't even pierce the IRS as long as you don't extract the data? Yeah, there are. I, I am personally aware of situations in which IRS data transfers can occur in a, in, in, a, in a different format in order to protect certain 6103 restrictions. So you are right about that. Okay, my time has expired. When you said yes, you are prepared to do it. I, I can yield to the gentleman an additional two minutes. I thank the gentleman, uh, but I will hopefully not use it all. The, uh, you didn't say that you would ask the President by executive order. You apparently historically do not have the uh, legislative authority. Are you going to come to us for legislative authority, and if so, when? I think let me step back and say that there are different avenues we can take to break down these data silos, in some case administrative, in some case we would need legislation. Uh, I believe we are, in a, uh, as we move forward on our efforts to detect fraud and understand more what we need to do to knock down these data silos, I think we will be back and asking you for help, legislative help, to, to create these types of, uh, of data transfers. I don't have a date certain by which I know we will come back. Uh, but it is our commitment to work with this committee in particular on these issues. Okay. And my closing question, which I would appreciate, just answer it for the record or briefly respond and then expand. Forensics clearly are not going to be enough alone. If I were Visa, MasterCard or any of the other, uh, if you will, world-class organizations, real-time online assessment is how you prevent the loss, not how you simply see if the courts are too backed up to go after the person once you find them. Ten million is obviously not for that. Do you have a plan to make any portion of the government as proactive as Visa, MasterCard? I don't know that I could articulate for you um, a, an overarching plan. I will say that prevent, I agree with the principle that prevention uh, comes first versus paying and chasing errors after they occur. Absolutely. There are situations that are emerging today where agencies are taking more aggressive steps to pause, to review, to place moratoriums on certain payments before they go out the door. That is part of the prevention. But a, a global cross-government plan that, uh, that initiates the type of neural networks that you are talking about, we don't have that in place yet. Uh, I think if we get to a point where we start to uh, knock down some of these data silos, that will open the door. We need to bring some smart people around the table to figure out how to enable such a, leveraging such, uh, such a new data environment. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman. I yield back. Thank you. And I would uh, like to recognize the Ranking Member, Mr. Cummings, for five minutes. Thank you very much. Um, Mr. Werfel, let me ask you this. The, uh, in the other panel, Ellen Miller talked about some agencies that were not uh, reporting. Were you here? Did you? I, was, I was. Can you talk about that for a moment? Um, and I was just wondering what we are doing to try to make sure that they do report. Well, thank you for the opportunity to, to respond to, to those uh, issues. First of all, I think it is a very important thing that the Sunlight Foundation is doing by raising these issues to our attention. It is part of transparency at work. We don't just self-identify errors. We rely on the public to re be reviewing our reports and finding those issues as well. And I think in some cases we are going to find that the public is going to report, like a group like Sunlight Foundation, on an error, and it is going to have a, a, a real immediate impact and be a legitimate uh, uh, issue for us to address. And sometimes uh, the error has an easy explanation and it is not really an error at all. And I think there was an example that was provided around uh, the school lunch program where USA spending doesn't require us to report payments under $25,000, which is the bulk of the school lunch payments, and that is why there is an absence of information. All that said, there are criticisms that were discussed in the first panel uh, that are valid. 
and we are not where we need to be in terms of the full completeness of the data. Uh, we have issued uh, a policy uh, at OMB that we think is having an impact on this that requires Federal agencies to initiate more robust quality assurance programs around the completeness, accuracy and timeliness of their data starting with a senior accountable official and moving forward to uh, the types of frameworks we see in our traditional financial statement reporting process, risk management, internal control review, reconciliation of information in our accounting systems to what is being reported on USAspending.gov. All of that is underway. But, Congressman, it is an evolving process, and as we move forward, uh, there will continue to be uh, points in time which we expect there, there, there will be some errors and we will get better and better at this as we go. You know, I often say that there are certain things that are a project and not a product. Uh, certain things are ever evolving. And the question is, um, are we doing, are we moving fast enough? We just heard from Commissioner of the SEC yesterday, in, in one of her reports, she talked about how uh, folk in, on Wall Street were moving so fast and coming up with all kinds of new products, uh, and, and, and in some instances so fast it was hard for SEC to keep up with them. And I'm just wondering, um, do, we have, do we have, first of all, the technology that we need? Um, is it from what you can see, problems stemming from folks who are just not doing what they are supposed to do? Is there a bigger hammer that needs to be um, hammered? I am just wondering. I think it's, I think it's a mixture. I would say that uh, there are moments that I see in, in, in my work where it is almost astonishing the progress that is being made. So, for example, uh, I look at recovery.gov today as an example. The information that is there, the level of detail, the, uh, the functionality of that website, and um, I think that that is uh, really a, a cutting edge uh, tool that uh, is probably far ahead of where I thought we might be five years ago if, if I was testifying before you then. Uh, and so that is exciting, and that I think rallies the rest of the community around what is possible. Uh, and really opens the door to even greater efforts. At the same time, there are agencies that I could probably say I would have thought would have been further along uh, if I was testifying here five years ago. To answer your question, I think, I think a bigger hammer is needed. I think what you have today is a dichotomy that was reported on the first panel that is accurate. We have a, uh, a, what I would argue is a very robust financial statement audit process that it exists today. It started in 1990. It has been 20 years. We have 20 of the 24 major agencies in government receiving a clean audit opinion. A lot of effort goes into scrutinizing to the tenth decimal point the numbers that go on our balance sheets and our other basic financial statements. And we have developed uh, a very robust process in response. Uh, that is moving forward and, and, and achieving important things in terms of financial reporting reliability. That robustness does not exist with respect to the information as reported on USAspending.gov. The spend information, as we call it, is not completely wired into the financial statement audit process. We think that we need to look at that audit process and that reporting model to potentially realign some of that audit scrutiny around spending information. I think you would see a difference in results if agencies felt the accountability of an auditor's eye on these issues. I ask for unanimous consent that I have the additional three minutes as the Chairman had. Absolutely. You Thank you very much. In your testimony, you also talk about the breadth and depth of reporting required by the Recovery Act, uh, 200,000 prime and Subrecipients file public quarterly reports with up to 99 distinct data fields. As you point out, this is more frequent than other major financial reporting required by the Federal Government, and yet recovery.gov seems to be uh, the best example of Federal spending transparency. Indeed, 99.6 percent of prime recipients filed on time last quarter. So, so I have to ask you this. Where did recovery.gov succeed in U.S.? a spending.gov struggle and why? It is a, a very good question. Um, I think, for one, the Recovery Act um, 
represented a point in time where there was tremendous accountability, uh, both vertically and horizontally, across government and recipients about getting the information reported in and getting it correct. There was uh, leadership engagement, uh, congressional oversight, uh, GAO has probably issued you know, 20 reports uh, auditing and looking at our activities to meet these requirements. There was a real sense, and, uh, and I'm glad of it, a real uh, healthy stress that was placed on the entire Federal environment and the, the recipients of the Recovery Act that, that, that this needed to be done transparently. Um, and it became one of the most major priorities that I have ever been involved in in order to make this work, make it successful. And we had a very talented individual in, in Earl Devaney at the board, uh, at the recovery board, helping us along the way. Um, and the stars aligned for, for great success. Uh, the USA spending environment, it hasn't been as similar. The law was passed in 2006. You did not see the same type of, uh, of, of, of emphasis, whether it be GAO, congressional or administration leadership, around getting those, uh, those data requirements up and running. Um, and, uh, and when this administration came in, it, it was confronted almost immediately with, uh, with the Economic Situation and the Recovery Act. Uh, we immediately looked at this as a major opportunity to deploy Recovery Act uh, reporting and recovery.gov successfully and have it set the milestone that USA spending would need to follow. And we already see evidence that that is following true, because up until the Recovery Act, we never had any subaward reporting in USA spending, and now we do. So we are already starting to see that this, uh, that this arc of can Recovery Act reporting set a new tone and a new watermark that would move USA spending in the right direction. It is already starting to materialize, but we still have to work at it. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. I would like to recognize the Ranking Member of the Subcommittee, Mr. Connolly, for his questions in five minutes. I thank the Chairman and welcome, Mr. Whirlpool. Welcome back to the Oversight and Government Reform Committee. Uh, you are a second home lately. Yes. Uh, we are glad to have you. And, and you, uh, I don't think, had joined us yet, but uh, the Chairman, Mr. Langford, uh, and I, in, in our respective opening statements, both praised the administration for the transparency initiative, uh, especially with respect to recovery.gov. So uh, I think there was public acknowledgment on a bipartisan basis that we have made a lot of progress. No, nothing is perfect. Um, you, in your testimony, uh, talked about the OMB and the CFO Council developing a new statement of spending to focus on how and where Federal dollars are being spent. Would that supplant the current CFS, and, and how would that work? It wouldn't, it wouldn't supplant it. It gets back to, uh, to part of the response to um, Congressman Cummings' question. How do you we, we confronted ourselves the following question. How do we drive more accountability for Federal agencies' reporting of spending information into USA Spending? And we feel like we have developed a pretty strong muscle in the area of basic financial statement reporting. The agencies have been doing it for years. They have set up IT systems and processes to do it. And so the question is, how do we, how do we walk in that game and talk in that dialogue? And that is where the concept of the statement of spending came because agencies have the ability and the experience and auditors have the ability and experience to audit basic financial statements. And we felt that if we can create a financial statement similar to our other statements that has the, the foundational information that goes into USAspending.gov, that you, in order to get a clean audit opinion on that statement of spend, it would automatically mean that the underlying source information is accurate and then the information that flowed into USAspending.gov by definition, therefore, would be more reliable. So what we are saying with the statement of spend is that is our suggestive strategy for how to integrate the reliability of USA spending information into what we believe has been a, a successful yet still emerging uh, initiative to improve basic financial reporting on things like balance sheets. Mm -hmm. um, are there best practices from USAspending.gov uh, that can be applied to other Federal agencies? That, and, and if so, how does OMB disseminate that or inculcate that? It's, it, absolutely. What, one of the things that we did 
when we started this process of, of moving forward on a ro more robust quality assurance program from USA Spending is we asked each agency to submit a uh, data quality plan. And you can look across those plans and see some agencies really ahead of the game in terms of the types of reconciliations that they are doing, looking at control totals, doing automated reports right out of their systems. I think Danny Harris, uh, Dr. Harris, did a very good job in, during his testimony of explaining how, how, how much they have leveraged their, their transaction infrastructure in a way to make this make more sense. But other agencies, not as, mu not as much. Other agencies are still doing more manual, what we sometimes call cuff reports, putting together the reports separately, and therefore it is not as efficient and is not as reliable. So the, you know, one of the basic missions of my office, the CFO Council, is to share this information across agencies. And we have working groups that are doing that to say, here is what Dr. Harris and the Department of Education are doing. They have it wired into to a process that is working for them and, and minimizing errors, and your agency is not doing as well of a job. And so how can we close that gap? And so that is part of the mission here. Um, let me ask you, because uh, I am going to run out of time, one, one more question. Um, at, in the category of transparency, um, at least speaking for this member, uh, I don't think we pay enough attention up here to tax expenditures. Uh, that is a real live spending item by any other name. We just don't like to talk about it, but it is a trillion dollars a year. Uh, what is OMB doing to try to make sure that we are shedding more light on tax expenditures and their relationship to the Federal deficit and their relationship to other aspects of Federal spending? Now, this, this is an issue that I think um, it is going to be one of those times in the hearing where I ask to come back to you with more information. I would like to consult with, with my colleagues at IRS. Uh, it is not currently uh, one of the required elements, for example, within Recovery Act reporting and USA spending. And so sometimes you know, we are so busy dealing with the statutory requirements that are before us and meeting, meeting all those deadlines that some of the other elements of transparency um, don't get on our radar screen uh, as much. And for me, that is true. My, my, my days and nights are spent meeting the requirements of, of the various you, laws before me. So let me, if I could, consult with IRS and then come back and brief your, your subcommittee on this issue. I yield to the, uh, the gentleman an additional three minutes of time. I thank the Chairman. And, and uh, um, I really welcome that. And, Mr. Chairman, um, I, I would hope that our subcommittee would welcome that, because I think this is a, if we are going to have transparency and we are going to have data available to the public, tax expenditures, if you look at how they are accounted and how we address them in budget documents and so forth, it is woefully inadequate. And it is a very substantial amount of opportunity cost from a revenue point of view. And it may be all good policy but it deserves the light of day. And so I would welcome your coming back to us in much more detail. And let me ask uh, that, uh, uh, and I would hope that uh, the Chairman would join me in this, that we would ask also for your recommendations about how better to capture both the value and the cost of such expenditures uh, moving forward. Um, and, Mr. Chairman, I would ask uh, whether you might be able to join me in that request. Yeah, that is a difficult one to track just because the uh, IRS code is nine times longer than the Bible. You think we have a few exceptions in there? <laughs> exactly. So, uh, all, gathering all of that and what the value, uh, value is included, I am sure, would be quite a task on that. And I don't know that, whether that GAO or who that might be to be able to land on and try to help us determine those things. Thank so, you so much. You're welcome. Um, and my final, final point uh, question would be, uh, I assume that both the uh, CTO and the CIO uh, Mr. Chopra and Mr. Uh, Kundra are involved in uh, the deployment of technology with, other, with your CFO Council in trying to, A, disseminate best practices, eliminate duplication, and improve transparency. Absolutely. It's, it's a partnership. It's, you know, Vivek Kundra, the government CIO, could have been sitting here today uh, just, as, just as I am. Uh, with the emphasis of this hearing on, on, on uh, reliability of reporting, uh, potential issues of audit. It just made more sense for me to be here. But we are attached at the hip on these issues. And uh, we have to solve this with a, uh, with a multidisciplinary approach. You know, it's just the auditor, just the accountant, not going to get it done. The technologist yeah. is critical to this effort as well. I think that is a really important point, Mr. Chairman. And with that, I yield back my time. And I thank the Chair for his generosity and consideration. Thank you. 
Mr. Ruffle, let, let me just run through a, a litany of questions here and just short answers and try to run through a couple of things on it as we try to finish this out. And thank you for waiting through the lunch hour uh, to be able to be here as well as we are finishing up the vote on it. You had mentioned earlier that there was a need for some legislation to correct some of the um, uh, data needs that are out there. Uh, I would like for your office to be able to provide to our committee uh, that list that you would say, here are the legislative fixes that we need uh, to be able to help resolve those things. If you could get that back to us, we will make sure that we share that uh, bipartisan way, uh, and that would be very helpful to us. Uh, there are a maze of sites that are out there. Uh, Recovery.gov was very well done. It got the information out quickly. It was so successful that now we have multiplied the .gov and uh, now we have recovery.gov and payment accountability accuracy.gov and IT dashboard.gov and all the agencies have it, research.gov, data.gov, and it goes on and on. I'm missing many that I know. How does an individual go find their information now? We've moved from it's out there, go search for it, when originally the design was let's lock into data.gov, usaspending.gov, and say if you are looking for something, go there. Is that still the mission? If so, how is it going? Uh, you are raising a, an enormously challenging element of open government and transparency. Mm -hmm. And there are many challenging elements to it. One of them is getting the data out there. Uh, and we are trying, uh, and I think making important progress in getting more raw information and other types of reports public, uh, in particular through the Web. The other cha another challenge, and there are numerous, but the other challenge is sometimes the, the quantity of the data that is out there can be overwhelming, and how are we assisting the citizenry in accessing that information? And right now, I think you have hit on something that, that, that is part of a strategy. It might not be the most effective strategy, and it is evolving, but it is the branding of our websites in ways that make sense. If you want to learn about grants, go to grants.gov. Um, you know, if you want to learn about where Federal dollars are going, usaspending.gov. If you are curious about the Recovery Act, recovery.gov. And you see the theme of trying to make it logical. And we do a lot of work uh, with citizens and user groups around these efforts to say what works for you. It is it's, you know, we don't, we don't do these websites in a vacuum. Correct. But what is the central portal going to be? If I don't know which one to go to, where do I go yeah, I to say that, that, this is where I start? Yeah, and I don't think that we have established a consistent central portal. I know that in the previous administration there was FirstGov, um, there is USA.gov is available, but I, I don't think that uh, that we've championed the starting point portal for the rest of government. But uh, it's let, something let, that let needs me just to say, let me ask you, and obviously I'm not going to order you on this one, one or the other on it, but let me ask you to examine that, because people outside of the Beltway do not know where to go. They do not know if they're looking for food stamp information to go to the Agriculture Department. Uh, they're not aware that there are education programs in the Department of Defense. Uh, they, they don't know how to be able to search for those things. Uh, so they need a central portal to go be able to ask the questions, and if they are going to get the data, to, and then it can take them to the spot that is going to go. It doesn't have to be all in one place. It can be these various sites. It does make sense. There are going to be some watchdog groups. They are always going to land on research.gov. That is what they research. That is what they want to go after, or the grants.gov. Uh, but there has to be a place for people to be able to go to if the information is out there that they know. Otherwise, many of the things that we talked about earlier with Dr. Harris and others, it is on their agency website. It is not on data.gov. It is not on usaspending.gov. It is over on their agency. Uh, so I can't go find it. So, uh, yes, uh, let me just recommit to the point that we are working towards that objective. Uh, that we have, as you mentioned, some success with the branding in terms of certain stakeholders sure. who automatically know where to go and, and we develop important partnerships with them, and that efforts are underway to reconcile the various .govs. Uh, what I would like to do is, as you say, come back, we will show you some of, the, of our thoughts on a strategic vision for that, and then let's partner together towards the right strategic vision. Let, let me bounce a couple other things past you. There is a great need we heard from uh, agriculture and education that some data standards. If things are going to go up, 
here is how they need to go up. And I gave the example earlier of an address field that include the entire address, including state, city, zip code, in one field. That is obviously not searchable. Uh, a, a single entity that is a contractor uh, needs to have an ID number that someone can search for that contractor and they can chase them down. There is a need from, o, from OMB to be able to provide back to the agencies, here are more data standards, even begging the question, what is a significant piece of data out there? And a for instance on that, if someone is going and looking for how many employees does an agency have, what is their budget? what are the programs that they are doing and what is the mission of those programs, there is no place they can go to get that. They are stuck searching through an agency website that may or may not have that. That seems to be fairly usable data that I think most American taxpayers would want to be able to look at a site like a data.gov, like something, whatever it may be, and to say how many people work there, what is the mission of the departments that are there, what are even the names of the departments that are there, and what is the budget for that, uh, to find a, an established piece on that. If that is something the OMB can begin on, that is something I think we should begin on as well to say there is a basic transparency piece that needs to get out there. Does that seem reasonable to you? It, it absolutely does. Uh, you know, I think if you looked at the landscape of data across government, you are going to obviously find significant uh, heterogeneity and opportunities for standardization. You will see some pockets of standardization that are promising sure. uh, and, and that we can build upon. But what you will also find is, is a lot of work to be done. Uh, sure. And we need to move out on a, on a strategic set of priorities. We have started. So, for example. No, and and I yeah. tell you, Ranking Member Connolly and I have both affirmed that. Yeah. This is the first administration to do this level of it. This is the beginning point. We understand. The criticism is not that we are starting it way to go on starting it and getting it out there. It's, I want to find out what are the lessons learned, what are we missing, and what are people asking for. And let me give you a for instance on it. It would be a help to this committee uh, that when the emails come back as feedback, and there are several of your sites that say for feedback or contact us for more questions, what data are you looking for, basically, if our committee were to get those things in real time at the same time. Uh, not that we are going to respond to those things, but that would allow us in our oversight role to be able to say, you know what, these are the data pieces people are asking for. And if our committee could get that unfiltered and it could be shared bipartisan, uh, then people could get a chance to say, you know what, a lot of people seem to be asking for this. Why is it that we don't provide that? That would allow us to be able to do our oversight a lot stronger. And let me make an, another comment to you. You mentioned the recovery.gov. That is a very successful site. You are right. It was very well done and the information was unprecedented that was put out. My feeling on it is one of the successes of it was the recipients were uploading information. It wasn't just a government entity that was putting that down there. They have got lots of other things. But the recipients were saying, yes, we received this, this is what we received, and this is the feedback for it. That is of great benefit. Is that something that is going to continue, and can that be replicated in USA spending in other places? Uh, yeah, and, and there are uh, many, many, I mean, a lot of the information that the Federal Government reports today, the source is the recipient of the Federal dollars reporting, whether they are reporting what is going on with the dollars from a financial perspective or a performance perspective. What was, I think, unique about the Recovery Act was the, uh, the automated nature of it, the speed of it, Correct. Uh, all of that. That is a platform that yeah. now exists, though. What I am asking is, is that a platform that will continue to be used? Will it be replicated in other areas to say the recipient can quickly say, yes, we have received this grant, and also be able to come back and say, this is what was done with it? Because one of the primary questions that I get a lot about grants and contracts and other things, was it actually accomplished? Did we do it? What, what happened with that? And I think there would be people that could look around their own neighborhood and could find this is what happened in my area. I had no idea that the Federal Government was involved in this area in positive ways. Uh, but they don't know unless there is some reporting back on accountability on that. So yeah. that recovery.gov platform of recipient reporting, is that something that is going to be multiplied out and used? It is, and it is ongoing today. And, right. and um, we have more and more uh, modernized and more seamless ways of collecting information from uh, non-Federal stakeholders, okay. uh, and that is going on today. In the, in the USA spending and other places, and has been referenced by several people, when, when there are gaps in it, and information is not showing up, or it is showing up that the contract is here or the grant is here, but just a zero amount. Yeah. Uh, how, how are they held to account in the agencies to get that information correctly, whether it be a data field is not done or the dollar amounts are completely left out? Is, is there a chain of command? Is there someone verifying that and saying, hey, we have got to get this correct? It seems the 30 some odd percent accuracy rate is not quite high enough for us. A couple of responses there. 
First, as, we, as mentioned earlier in, in my testimony and mentioned on the first panel, right now the, the process is a, is a self-assessment. We have asked the agencies to create a senior accountable official and then an internal process to validate completeness and accuracy. And there are some limitations in the self-assessment. Uh, the, the, an independent eye, whether it is the inspector general or an auditor coming in to review that, is going to drive improvements and more objectivity, and the results will improve. Secondly, I want to just, on the record, uh, take a, uh, a different perspective on the 30 percent uh, success rate that was in the testimony of, the, uh, of one of the other witnesses from the Sunlight Foundation. Uh, the method we, we have concerns with the methodology uh, surrounding that, um, and I don't need to go into great detail, uh, but, uh, but we do not believe the, uh, the success rate is as low as the Sunlight sure. Foundation. Well, it's just, the, it's just the key data coming out. I, I did a quick search on just for Oklahoma, my home state, and to be able to look at it and see some of the things that are in U USA uh, spending and, and tracking through the, the different things that are there. There is just a for instance, in last year there were helicopter services uh, contract that was put out, but there is no amount that is listed on that one. Uh, so we, we, we don't know what that one is. But there is a peanut butter, apparently, contract that was done for a little over $2 million. Now, that seems like a large amount of peanut butter. Uh, we go through a lot of it at my house. Uh, but in this particular report, and I could go on and on, there are multiple areas that are zeroed out and page after page. There are about 17 pages listed. A lot of zeros that are listed here. And, and, and I don't know if we bought $2 million worth of peanut butter in Oklahoma uh, or not from a government contract, uh, but th there just seems to be some issues that I could look at and I could say, okay, somebody needs to be verifying this data and making sure it is complete and there needs to be a process. It is a very good thing to get the data out there, but to get it out wrong or incomplete uh, raises all sorts of questions. Absolutely. Uh, and um, as I think it was evidenced during the first panel, some of the criticisms or concerns about the data have rational explanations, and some of them it is it's, it's just a, a, a basic data quality issue that we need to address. Uh, I think uh, the more people that are searching this data and using this data, uh, the more we, we move in the direction of, of better quality. Uh, the fact that you can go online and find that $2 million of Federal dollars were spent on something related to peanut butter is something that could not have been done That's correct. Uh, before. And uh, for that, we want to celebrate that, leverage it, make sure that we do have a more accountable government. But as you point out, there are gaps in the reporting and we are working on closing them. That is the best gift that we can give is transparency. Watchdog groups, outside citizens groups, the contractors themselves being able to look back on the site and say, was it reported correctly, is that accurate, is a tremendous asset to them. And we want to continue to multiply that and make sure that that does occur. So with that, Mr. Connolly, did you have additional questions that you want to add? If the Chairman would yield, I, I was just going to actually add to your point that uh, it, is, it, it may be a good thing to celebrate the fact that uh, we can now uh, solve the peanut butter yeah. mystery. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, we may want more information. Uh, and I would, because it is not intuitively obvious to the searcher why we would be spending $2 million tax dollars on peanut butter. And so while we are celebrating the fact that one can access that piece of data, I would hope that, to the Chairman's point, that we, we try to make these search engines even more useful by way of, and here is why we are buying $2 million worth of peanut butter. Right. right. And, and as an example, if I could respond to that, a, a legitimate explanation might be, it might be part of the school lunch program, and therefore it is right. uh, there is there's there's an easy explanation. Completely but, agree. And, and I would say that uh, the ranking member mentioned uh, in his opening statement uh, that th there is not a need to be able to track every paper clip. Uh, that is not what I think the American people are looking for on it. Uh, but I think it is these broad categories to know that it is consistent. We know what that is. The information is getting out there. It is trackable. It is traceable. For instance, if a report is done, people want to know if there was a report done on wildfires and this certain bird nest was done, it asks the obvious question, how much did that cost to do that report? Well, we, we know there was a grant that was given to be able to do that. We should be attaching that report to the cost of producing that report so everyone could know and evaluate, is that good use of taxpayer dollars, and then start the conversation. That is a good thing for us. Uh, as legislators to be able to look at and be able to see, and for people in our districts to hold us to account on that, that is a good thing for us to hold you to account to say we need that information to get out there. If a report is done, how much does it cost, can they find it and be able to track it is a reasonable thing. 
If there are no additional questions on it, Mr. Werfel, thank you very much for being here. We have a great deal to do. We look forward to your follow-up reports on it, and this hearing is adjourned. Thank you. Thanks, Jane.